Good morning, everybody from quarantine. Um, sounds like unlike everybody else, I was asked to do this lecture yesterday. So, and I was also told it was an OBGYN week. So I hope, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this might be the only one then. Um, so I wanted to talk a little about medications and pregnancy because this is something we end up having to tackle every day in the ED with or without COVID, I would say. So I wanted to thank Dr. Wiener and Winky, the cat. Hopefully he doesn't interrupt us too much during this. So why is this important? So everybody has probably heard of thalidomide before. This was a medication developed in Germany. It was used pretty widely in Europe as a anti-morning sickness medication. There were some reports coming out about neuropathy and limb uh, agenesis, dysgenesis, limb length abnormalities. And so in the US, there was this one doctor, Dr. Kelsey, who worked for the FDA and prevented it from coming mass market to the US. And that kind of saved American babies for the most part. However, Europe was not so lucky and many thousands of babies were born because of thalidomide exposure with limb abnormalities. The New York Times actually just yesterday had two pieces about the few babies in the US that actually were exposed from a kind of informal clinical trial when we didn't have as many protections for subjects. So you can check that out, but this is why it's important to understand the effects of the medications you're taking or you're giving patients when they're pregnant and what they're taking. So a little bit of an outline. I just, these are the, the broad categories of the medications that I wanted to talk about. The first is just the medication pregnancy categories. And then we're just gonna go through all of these very anti-psychotics, anti-emetics, antidepressants, analgesics, antipyretics, antibiotics. They all start with A's. Um, and I think these are all things that we tackle all the time in the ED when somebody gets told that they're pregnant and they're already on one of these medications or you're trying to decide what to start somebody on when you diagnose them with something. So I did want to say June 2020, so this year, the labeling guidelines are going to change and they're supposed to have been phasing out all of these categorizations as we know them. And so then we're gonna talk about them today, they're actually supposed to go away. There's no longer gonna be A, B, C, D, X, and N. It's just gonna be more specific labeling for pregnant and lactating patients that will give more of a discussion. So A essentially shows that there's no risk in controlled human studies. These are extraordinarily rare. It's hard to do studies on pregnant women and so very few drugs are actually category A. Category B, or Bateman, um, these are a little bit more common. There is compelling human data that they're safe, but it's mostly that there's animal models that show that they're safe and that there's no risk to the fetus. Still not the most common category. C as in cat, so these are medications that have been shown in some studies to maybe have some harm, but there's not compelling randomized data showing that there's adverse events in humans, and there's good compelling reasons to use these medications. So this is part of like risk benefits and alternatives conversations that we'll talk about more. D is in dog. Um, there's clear evidence of risk. They should be avoided when you can. However, when there's an overriding medical requirement and need for these, you should still be giving these medications potentially, but having that risk benefits alternative conversations, even more important. X is an X-Men. These are never give. They're known to be teratogenic. They're harmful. Never give them. There aren't that many medications that are actually at category X's, but the ones that are out there, avoid them. And then category N, as in NOAA, um, 
these haven't been classified. And from what I can tell, it also appears to be these haven't been, or these have been declassified. So as I said, they've been phasing out all of these categorizations. And as part of that, they've removed categories when you go and look them up. So let's start with antipsychotics. So just broadly speaking, there's minimal evidence to support their safety or harms. They're almost all category Cs. These are medications that if somebody is off of, you have to be very sure that there's not gonna be some detrimental effects. So you need to have that discussion about risk benefits alternatives. And it's not something we should probably be discontinuing or changing in the emergency department if they're already on these. And it's important to understand that we're just one small part of this picture and we need to be a part of the whole team in figuring out what is the safest thing and we need to tell our patients that. So I just wanted to list out some common antipsychotics. The one in yellow are the typical antipsychotics. Um, there's a little bit more data for them, but they're older medications they seem to maybe have a slightly higher risk. And so OBGYNs prefer to switch patients to atypicals, but the data is not great for the atypicals. If anything, it's better for the typicals in terms of showing that there's risk versus the atypicals. It's only animal models. You can't say that they're necessarily so much safer, but the aim is to try and minimize the dose of whichever one. A single dose of Haldol, or olanzapine in the ED is probably not going to be a concern. I wanted to bring up lithium here. We all learn in medical school about the Epstein anomaly and cardiac anomalies are the big concern. It's a category D, so you're supposed to try to avoid it. However, people with bipolar disorder, you really get concerned if they're going to end up having a manic episode during pregnancy or after pregnancy. And so most of the pieces I found seem to recommend not necessarily discontinuing it, having this discussion with patients and monitoring their levels closely due to all the physiologic changes that occur during pregnancy. But patients should be aware that there is a risk of them taking this. But the actual number of anomalies is pretty low when they look at the large population studies. Antiemetics, I think, come pretty well after antipsychotics because a lot of them have some antidopaminergic effect and we use them all the time. Diclegis, which is the combination of pyridoxine and doxylamine, it's the only category A antiemetic. So most people would recommend that this is your first line. Metoclopramide or Reglan, it's an antipsychotic for all intents and purposes. So its side effects are EPS. They haven't noted any congenital malformations. And then Adansetron is the main one that we have to always think about um, and that has been talked about the most. And it seems to go back and forth from year to year of whether or not this is a safe medication. I believe Dr. Sinner sent out about a year ago, and EMA covered an article that used that data and some additional data as well that essentially showed that there is a small increase in possible renal agenesis and maybe some cranial facial defects, but the incidence is really small. The renal agenesis cases was out of maybe 22 total cases in general over the entire population. And all of these patients were simple exposures. There's no dosing data. It's unclear why these patients were put on Ondansetron in general. And so they could have been people who had been refractory to treatment and already were higher risk for problems due to inadequate uh, diet and nutrition from hyperemesis. Promethazine has, is an anti-muscarinic, but also has some anti-dopaminergic effects. It's actually category C, even though I've had OBGYN recommend that over a Dancitron, 
diphenhydramine is safe and prednisone is used for refractory cases and is a category C and D for long acting. There are probably more risks of that than a lot of the other medications and it's pretty well studied compared to the others. So antidepressants, just like the antipsychotics, there's lots of concerns of early discontinuation of therapy for patients. And so it's generally important to have a big team-based discussion with their psychiatrists, primary providers, minimize their doses. But in general, they're category C. There's minimal risk that have been seen in animal studies. But again, there's very little human data. And that's the problem with all these categorizations. Analgesics and antipyretics. These are also something that we use every day. Obviously, acetaminophen is the mainstay of treatment. There have been some reports of anomalies of fetal abnormalities. However, the data is terrible. For NSAIDs, we learned in med school about ductal closures. So it's avoided. It's a class category D in the third trimester. And there's some more recent data saying that in the first trimester, that there's a dose durational response curve um, towards the proximity towards con of conception for spontaneous abortions. It's not great data. Women are on these medications in general. So it's not something that we're discontinuing so easily. And a single dose of Ketorolac in the ED is unlikely to cause harm, even though we always, almost always wait for that beta HCG to come back. Um, and it seems to be the greatest harm is less than eight weeks. The opioids are considered safe to use. They're category C. Fentanyl is here. Australia, C, they've already removed them for fentanyl and oxycodone, for morphine and oxycodone in the U.S., but these are safe to use. Tramadol, I only wanted to put up here to say, don't give it to anybody. There's really no patient, whether pregnant or not pregnant, who should be on this. MRAP has a good piece about how terrible tramadol is. And I did want to note methadone and buprenorphine are category Cs. They're safe. A woman going into withdrawal is more dangerous to their child. And I would recommend getting somebody tied in to a proper program for these because it also takes them out of the criminal justice system. Women who have been denied access to these by their primary providers and psychiatrists have gotten them on their own because they don't want to get heroin and deal with intravenous drug use and have ended up getting arrested when they test positive. So these are things that you need to work with the OBGYN colleagues, with psychiatry and addiction medicine to make sure that patients are being properly treated. And it's the safest alternative to actually getting medications on the street. So antibiotics, I know for me, this is the most common thing where somebody has an infection, whether it's a pneumonia, a UTI, and I want to double check that it's safe. And luckily, it's pretty good for what we usually use in the emergency department. Immunoglycosides are category Ds. Beta and monolactams, obviously the mainstay of most of our therapy, so including all of our penicillins, our cephalosporins, Vancomycin, estreonam, the carbapenems are all category B with the exception of imipenem celastin, which I never end up using. But anybody with a UTI can be treated with a beta lactam. Um, anybody with a skin and soft tissue infection, you can keep them on a beta lactam. Fluoroquinolones, which we already try to avoid, are category Cs and do have some evidence of um, possible teratogenetic effects. Macrolides are safe, especially azithro and um, erythro. However, clothromycin is a category C, and so generally should be avoided. Tetracyclines, we obviously all learn about doxycycline and how it should be avoided because of bone and tooth discoloration. However, it specifically is indicated in life-threatening tick-borne illnesses, clindamycin, so that patient that you're trying to treat for MRSA, and it's been used, it's used all the time for mastoiditis, is a category B and safe to use. 
metronidazole, I was kind of surprised that the topical vaginal application is actually associated with hydrocephalus and is meant to be avoided. And you should avoid it in the first trimester and greater than 32 weeks. Uh, nitroferrin tone and safe Bactrim category C avoid in first in 32 weeks and also can have some G6PD issues. Asthma, about 42% of pregnant women who have asthma are going to have a serious asthma attack while they're pregnant. And so this is important. Um, albuterol, epitropium are safe. Prednisone we already talked about is a category C and D but this is you know, risks, benefits, and alternatives, and this is our best chance to prevent somebody from having status asthmaticus causing hypoxia to the fetus. The same thing goes for epinephrine. It is a category C, but when you have somebody in status asthmaticus and you wanna prevent somebody from being intubated and you're trying to do everything you can, this is your best bet. Um, and then ketamine, if you're intubating them, is considered safe, and fluticasone, Flovent, uh, there's not great data, but appears to be safe for preventing uh, asthma attacks in pregnant women. Anticoagulants, the most important thing to take away from here is warfarin is unsafe. However, if they're on a mechanical heart valve, that's an exception that you can consider continuing them on it as long as their dose is less than uh, five milligrams per kilogram um, a day. DOAX are considered contraindicated due to their inadequate information. And if somebody doesn't have a mechanical heart valve, anoxaparin, lovinox is the way to go. Antihypertensives, most of these are safe. Um, however, what we are tested in boards, medical school, and everything is that no ACEs or ARBs, they can cause renal agenesis. Per traditionally, people have preferred labetal, hydralazine, and methyl dopa. However, diuretics, uh, dihydropyridines, calcium channel blockers, and clonidine are all safe in pregnancy. And so these are things that you can continue to use. And there's more data showing that the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are also good and safe for preeclampsia. Antihyperglycemics, anti so not just gestational diabetes, but for just any woman who already has diabetes before they became pregnant, number one generally recommended is insulin, diet, and activity modification. Uh, both glyburide and metformin are safe in pregnancy and have been well studied for gestational diabetes and diabetes in general. However, there's no other oral antihyperglycemic agent that I found that is approved and is recommended, and they're only recommended to be used if you're part of a trial. There's very minimal data in this area other than for glyburide, metformin, and insulin. So some take-home points. The categories are going away, and so it's gonna be a, maybe a little harder for us to as quickly and easily decide what a medication is, but that's probably going to help us have better conversations with our patients. Most of these medications, there's very little data to support one way or the other. Um, most medications are category C, which just means maybe there's some harm in animal models, but it's not been shown in humans. Almost everything you need to have a discussion with your patient about whether they want to continue this, the risks of discontinuing it, um, and if there's any alternative therapies. No ACEs or ARBs. Warfarin is only good to be used if they have a mechanical heart valve. Um, if they're on another oral antihyperglycemic agent, then glyburide or metformin, you should probably talk about switching them. And very few meds are actually absolutely contraindicated, and that's part of why they're getting rid of the categorizations. Any questions? I will. That was a great lecture, really a great lecture, and emphasizes the importance how you have to think when you're prescribing is the patient pregnant and also when they're lactating, which 
wasn't part of this lecture, although you briefly mentioned it, but it's very, very important. And um, one thing I did want to come in on is I, I feel safer in hyperemesis with Reglan than I do with Zofran. There have been some questions in the last week about Zofran, and it's just the newer medication. So I tend to use Reglan if I have to, and obviously pyridoxine and that combination of pyridoxine to send them home on. I, I agree with uh, Dr. Grinschheimer. I think, I think just not only because of safety, because if you look at the recommendation, the first line is the pyridoxine and then Reglan. So I think also just giving a stepwise protocol for the patient is beneficial too. Because if you go straight to uh, Zofran, um, you haven't given anything else uh, a chance to work. And especially when the ED, it's nice to kind of, when you go back and they still say they're feeling bad, you can say, okay, I got something else for you. And you can kind of give that stepwise approach. Also another class of medications that I uh, noticed that we kind of interact a lot with pregnant women is uh, just the over-the-counter full remedies. For the most part, the recommendation is just try to stay away from anything systemic. So just try to use things that are locally effective, so like nasal sprays, things like that, rather than using uh, over-the-counter uh, uh, systemic uh, antihistamine, things like that. Gaviscon for GERD. Mm -hmm. Much Love better drug. <laughs> and it's not a drug, it's over-the-counter. It's not absorbable. I, I give that to all the women who I send home. But Gaviscon, it's, uh, it's over-the-counter, it's cheap, it's calcium carbonate, with algaic acid, so when it hits this stomach,